This video is brought to you by Skillshare, and let's crack on with the minute promotion up front for an uninterrupted video in just a sec. If you don't know about Skillshare, well, where have you been? Because I think it's great. It's an online learning community with thousands of classes to improve your skills across a wide range of topics. So instead of shelling out big bundles of cash for in-person courses, you can get an annual subscription for $10 a month and learn unlimited. There's some great classes for starters, like this course on creating professional video with the tools you already have. You're not always going to be thrown into the deep end, but if you are ready to dive in, there are advanced classes too. Now, thanks to their sponsorship today, you can get yourself a two-month free trial and check out as much as you want by clicking the link in the description below. It's a great offer. It's how I got started with Skillshare myself, so go for it and see what you can learn. Okay, video time. Hello. Yes, this is my face again. Let's have a quick chat about something that may or may not actually be a problem at all, but the discussion comes up every so often, so let's talk about it. How do we separate the consequences for drivers and their teams in cases where only one of those two parties has actually done something wrong? This most commonly comes up after an unsafe release, when a pit crew releases a driver back into the pit lane, into the path of another car, usually. In this case, the driver has done nothing wrong. They are literally just following orders. And I don't mean that in the Nazi sense. I mean, the driver literally cannot see out of their tiny enclosed 300 km an hour bathtub, so they need to be told exactly when they're free to go. Nonetheless, an unsafe release often means some kind of penalty, a drive through or a time penalty of some description, and what may have been a very successful race for them is ruined. And when we see this play out, we often feel aggrieved for the driver. It's not their fault, but as the driver and team are inextricably interlinked, both must suffer the penalty, including the innocent party, in this case the driver. And while most come to the conclusion that it is a team sport and they win and lose together, let's just play pretend for imagination's sake and ask how do we even start to try and reward and penalise the team and its drivers separately? First, let's look at the kind of mistakes that can cause a loss of points. The car could break down, the driver could crash, the driver could be taken out by someone else. There's that unsafe pit stop we talked about. There's a team misbehaving, like maybe illegally spying or standing in the pit lane with the wrong equipment or something. There's having a properly illegal car, you know, like it's got four engines or adjustable wings or something. And then there's having a mildly illegal car, like the floor slightly crosses the allowed geometry planes, or the car has a minuscule power spike during the race or something. There's also dodgy driving, like cutting a chicane or weaving or not following safety car procedures, that kind of thing. And let's say drivers behaving badly, like ignoring procedure, swearing at the FIA on the radio or holding up a political message on the podium. I'm sure there's loads more, but let's not be here all day listing infractions. So we can loosely split these things into driver's fault, team's fault and bad luck. With the bad luck pile, I guess it doesn't really matter about separating consequences. You just have to accept these things and move on together. So let's start with the team infractions first, as these are potentially much simpler to deal with. Option one, you deduct points from the team and the team only. This has actually happened before. In fact, it happened twice to McLaren in 2007. Firstly in Hungary, where the team got stripped of all its points, bizarrely for Alonso playing silly buggers during Q3, and then it got all of its points removed for having stolen Ferrari technical data. In both cases, both drivers got to keep all of their own points though, but completely wiping out team points isn't always the appropriate move. Should a team really lose 25 whole points if their driver wins, but they nearly took out Roman Grosjean in the pit lane? Seems a hefty price to pay. There could be potentially a viable system in which team points penalties are treated in the same way as driver time penalties. Two points for a little thing, five points for a bigger thing, and so on. The downside here, apart from making us spreadsheet nerds frustrated by the extra complications, and fastest lap points already did enough for that, thank you. Now the downside is that points are worth different amounts to different teams. A five point penalty to Mercedes is almost nothing, but to Williams it's an absolute disaster. They could have spent all season gathering those five points. Or a midfield team. Five points is nothing to be sniffed at there either. The battle is much closer there than at the top. Five points could be three championship positions by the end of the season. Now, in some cases, the FAA just hand out a fine to the team. A loose-fitted wheel is an instant fine, for example. 
so perhaps a dangerous pit stop or fitting the wrong tyre from a different set should have fixed price penalties. But again we run into problems. Not only do monetary amounts have different values to different teams, with the massively rich teams able to shrug off 10 grand more easily than say pass, but then you've also effectively put a price on cheating. If big teams can infest hundreds of thousands into shaving off a tenth of a second by reshaping an end plate or something, why wouldn't they be more blasé in the pit lane if it could gain them perhaps a whole second over the competition for a few grand in the swear jar? I'm sure every team principal would take so many slaps on the wrist that it would hurt to wear a watch if they got to move up position in the standings. So here's a wackier idea. Why not separate the driver and the team points completely? So in this scenario, the top 10 drivers on track all score points for where they finished as usual. But for the teams, only the highest place of their cars is ranked and the other car is ignored. So let's take the Australian Grand Prix this year, for example. These are the full results. But if we just focus on the constructors and erase the second place driver from each team, shuffle them back up again and award them the full top 10 points, it's still kind of fair because that's the best result each team did manage to get that race. It might lead them into effectively abandoning their second driver during the race, but you never know if your lead driver will retire, so you've got to balance both cars to play it safe. And if we let the system play out until the Russian Grand Prix, which was the last race when I'm recording this, we see the constructor's standings are still in the same order, albeit a little less spread out, which is good if anything. Leaves plenty on the table to play with. And if we separate out both championships like this, we can start to play more with things like points penalties for rules infringements because there are more points on the line for each team. You could even revise how many points a team gets for each infringement, maybe giving different penalties depending on where they finish. So a small infringement could be worth five points for a win, but only one point for fifth place. And two small infringements in a race or a medium infringement could be 10 points from your win or two points from fifth place and so on. Now this could get complicated, but when has F1 ever done things simply? I'll tell you, never, that's when. Driving cars around a circle 60 times is not a simple business and it never will be. Okay, so that's one wild idea on the table. Uh, maybe could work. If F1 gets their TV graphics working well, it might not even be that hard to follow. Maybe. Okay, so let's go back to our list of infringements. I think these ones highlighted here have definite potential to be brought into the team-only punishment pool. These ones here, I think, have to be left both for team and driver to take the hit together. If a car breaks down, for example, there's nothing really you can do. If the car is properly illegal and gaining an unfair advantage, then both team and driver are benefiting, so both need to be brought down with penalties. A slight technical infringement, though, one that technically breaks the rules but doesn't actually bring any benefit to the driver, a bit of bodywork slightly out of place, a tiny bit of fuel flow over pump, then really the driver hasn't done anything wrong and probably didn't gain an advantage. Punish the team for stepping over the line so they don't take the piscine, but give the driver the benefit of the doubt. So what about if the driver alone does something wrong? How on earth do we save the team from punishment in this case? Let's say your driver crashes out of the race. You can't magically bring the car back to life just for the team's benefit, but in a system where the driver's and team's points are separate, one car hitting the wall just means the other car is now in command of all the points. It may be slightly fewer points, but it's not gonna be as big a loss for the team as it might have been. And if the trailing car crashes, then it's no loss at all. But what if the driver does something pretty dodgy on track? Moving in the braking zone, cutting a corner, squeezing someone wide, that kind of thing. Well, normally they'd be given a five second penalty or something, which would punish the team as well as the driver and neither would get the points they would have got. But what if, and let's be honest, this is a terrible idea and I don't think I can sell it to you, but what if you gave the driver a time penalty that they don't have to physically take? You know, like if they get a five second penalty, but they've already taken their last pit stop, so it just gets added to their finishing time. Now, what if this only applies to the driver and not the car? That way the team potentially gets to keep the position they finished in, but the driver doesn't. Except now we've definitely strayed into way too complicated territory here. Like, can you imagine a car having two different finishing times? Can you imagine trying to keep up with that through the race if multiple penalties start getting given out? Can you imagine trying to work out the finishing order when sometimes stewards can't even work out the grid until a few hours before the race? 
And again, this is prone to exploitation. If late in the season, a driver is out of contention for a decent championship position, but the team is still fighting in the constructors. The team could ask the driver to go cutting corners, knowing that their constructors points will not be sacrificed. No, this, this gets too messy. They say there are no bad ideas, but they are wrong. Final crazy idea then, and I'm not the first to suggest this by a long shot, and it will never happen despite being amazing. Don't contract drivers to teams. Have them rotate race by race into a new team. That way, each driver gets a shot at each car and, as such, a hypothetically equal shot at the title, because over the year they'll have used all equal machinery. Similarly, each team gets to use each driver, so the points gathered overall will reflect the quality of their car. Now breakdowns and crashes will still happen, but the risk is now spread out among teams and drivers. Each driver will get their share of unreliable and bulletproof cars, and each team will have to have Romain Grosjean at some point. It's all fair. Now for this to work, you need to have at least as many races as there are teams, which we have. In fact, each driver can visit each team twice in a 21 race calendar. And then on the 21st race, the finale, just put the best drivers in the best cars, you know, based on the current standings, and use a reverse grid. What a climax. And this will never happen due to the ridiculous amount of money spent on commodifying drivers to a team, but can you imagine? Who would pay the driver's salaries in this case? Would we have to go full communism? Do I care? Not much. And so this has ended up being a propaganda video in support of F1 going fully socialist. You will have been sucked into my political web and admit it, you love it. We the people should take the control of Formula One back from the other oligarchs and rename it Formula All. This has been Chain Bear. Viva la revolution.